Um, and so next I want to introduce one of our um, newer physicians. How long have you been with us, Matt? A month. A month. So, but I've known him 20 years. So Matt Javernick um, joins us. Um, he uh, is fellowship trained in sports medicine. He's covered uh, a lot of trauma one uh, emergency rooms. So he really has uh, skills in a lot of areas. And we're really glad to have him with us. Awesome. Thanks, Rock. Thank you guys uh, for sure for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk about the rotator cuff, but just a little bit on myself. I'm from Loveland, Colorado, did a military scholarship, and uh, finally had a chance to make it back, back home. So super psyched to be back here. Family's still here. Friends still here. My mom still teaches uh, kindergarten at Garfield down in Loveland, so it's just awesome to be back. Anyhow, so today we're going to talk about the rotator cuff, and shoulder pain is one of the most common complaints that people have in musculoskeletal problems throughout their lifetime. And the rotator cuff is the primary cause of that. The pain that's related to the rotator cuff is really a spectrum of disease. And if we understand kind of how the rotator cuff functions, we can understand how it fails. And if we understand that, we can really help our patients uh, and see how we treat, treat that shoulder. So those are going to be our goals today. How does it function? How does it fail? How can you use that knowledge to help treat the patient? And today we're not going to get lost in the forest for the trees, and these are going to be broad strokes on the rotator cuff. And we're actually going to build a model. And nobody can make fun of my model because it's, uh, these graphics are made by myself. So it'll be a dynamic model. It'll be cool, I promise. Uh, we're going to look at the shoulder from the front and from the side, so an AP and lateral of the shoulder. And we're going to drop our little guy away. And now we're going to add the rotator cuff. So the supraspinatus on the top, subscapularis on the front, and then our infraspinatus and teres on the back. They reach out and grab that humeral head and hold that head in place. And they make that cuff of tissue. That's why we call it the rotator cuff. On our model, we're going to add our acromion. And then off that acromion comes the deltoid. Now that deltoid obviously wraps all the way around the front. And um, we're going to focus on this front view. We're not going to keep that rope or the deltoid all the way around and we're going to leave off the pectoralis and the lat as well. So we're only going to look at these functions of the shoulder. We're also going to kind of avoid the scapular motion that contributes to uh, the rotator cuff and really focus just on the function of the rotator cuff. So our muscles only do one thing, right? They always pull. So with the shoulder, the big power muscles are our deltoid and the pec and the lat. And when they fire, they move the arm in space. And as that arm moves up, the rotator cuff's job is to keep that ball centered. And as we bring that arm over our head, we actually a rotator cuff and it pulls down. Um, it really gives us this really cool mechanical advantage to the rotator cuff. It's really pretty awesome design if you think about that. You know, we only have a small amount attached, but we can do tremendous things with our arm. We can lift great weight away from our body. And it's because of this mechanical design that uh, gives us that function. Because that's so complex, it has a high failure rate. So let's talk about how it fails. Well, one, trauma. Obviously, if you have enough trauma across any tissue, you can tear, tear the structure, you can tear the rotator cuff. When our younger patients, that rotator cuff is flexible, it's pliable. It's really hard to even tear at all. Shoot, they can dislocate the shoulder, fracture the shoulder, and that rotator cuff will stay intact. So when we think about younger patients that have rotator cuff symptoms, it's usually not the rotator cuff that's really the problem. It's usually more of like an instability issue. And that's not really the focus of this talk today. This talk is more about, hey, why does the rotator cuff cause him pain? So how else does the rotator cuff start to fail? Well, unfortunately, just age and the process of uh, losing that muscle balance across the shoulder, which is really important for our therapists here. Um, when we start to lose that muscle balance, the, that cantilever effect, we start to lose that mechanical advantage. We also know that the blood supply changes as we age. When we're young, we have great blood supply all the way out to the attachment of that tendon. But that blood supply over time diminishes. As that diminishes, you know, we get, I'm going to go back here for a second. As that blood supply diminishes, when we get these little micro tears in that tendon, there's that watershed area of the rotator cuff where it attaches to the bone. That 
can't always heal. We get these little tears over time. It's like a, a piece of leather is what I think about. When that piece of leather is healthy and conditioned, it's really pliable. But over time, as it starts to dry out, it becomes more brittle. Repetitive little motion can cause that to start to fail and subsequently lead to long-term problems. So how, do we, how does it start to fail as we start to move it? Well, as that cuff starts to get injured, whether it's from impingement underneath the acromion or if it's just tendinopathy from doing some repetitive motion, we get inflammation, and that inflammation causes pain. And that's the, really the start of the rotator cuff pathology. Which came first, impingement or tendinopathy? I mean, you could have a debate on that. We could look, talk about studies that show what is causing the actual pain. But ultimately, from an uh, orthopedic standpoint, we know that pain is coming from that rotator cuff and that inflammation in that area. Well, how do we treat that? Well, one, activity modification. It's really common for our 30 to 40-year-old patient to come in and say, that, hey, I painted my kiddo's ceiling and now my shoulder hurts. Yeah, I'd expect that. You haven't been doing that your whole life. When we're young, we're tumbling all over the place, swinging on the monkey bars. As adults, we sit down at the computer and we're not doing a lot overhead. And if we spend one day doing a whole bunch of things overhead, you're going to irritate that rotator cuff and it's going to hurt. So what's our first line of treatment? Hey, if it hurts doing that, stop doing that. Next, pain medication. Again, this is actually kind of controversial. Like, what, what do we do? Do we give them anti-inflammatories? Well, there's some studies out there that say if we throw anti-inflammatories out there, we're actually stopping that healing response and the rotator cuff can't heal, so we might be doing a disservice by giving non -steroidals. Obviously, we just can't give people narcotics. I still prescribe anti-inflammatories in the acute phase to try to shut it down, but is it the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. We could probably debate that. Physical therapy is the mainstay. You know, we've already talked about that cuff losing its blood supply and it's losing a little bit of muscle balance, so therapy is really the mainstay. If we can strengthen that rotator cuff, while we're strengthening that, it also stimulates blood flow to that area. All good things. Um, if we can balance that muscle structure out, most of the time you can totally control these symptoms. You have to get your parents, your parents, your patients to buy in on that because if, uh, you know, a lot of patients are either too gung-ho and they start to, oh, this is not enough weight, I've got to start powering it, and they start to engage their pec or their lap, you're defeating the purpose. You really have to tell your patients, hey, go slow. You're just going to work on that rotator cuff. They're the balance muscles. Do these little light exercises, but in control, and you're going to start to see a difference. We can do injections. We can do lots of different injections. And again, this is my animation, filling that subacromial space, and that can decrease that inflammation in there. What can we inject? Well, we can inject a lot of different things. We can do a lidocaine challenge. We can do that if we're uncertain on our diagnosis. So sometimes when you have rotator cuff pathology, it's hard to know, hey, is the pain coming from the shoulder or is it coming from a neck or a radicular symptoms? So we can put local anesthetic right in that subacromial space, and if that pain goes away, we know it's the shoulder. If we're confident that we put it in that subacromial space or if we do it under ultrasound and the pain doesn't go away, then we start thinking, hey, is there other, other things going on? Is there a radiculopathy? Can you have both going on at the same time? Yeah, unfortunately you can. We can do steroid for rotator cuff tendinopathy. It actually works really well. It shuts down that inflammatory cycle and kind of resets the shoulder, which can be very successful. Now, we can say, hey, is a steroid the best option for the rotator cuff? I don't know. We know that if you give repeated injections, that rotator cuff actually gets a little bit weaker. And if you have to repair it down the line, we know that that repair is going to be more likely to fail. So younger patients, we don't like to keep slamming steroid in every two or three months. Once, once in a while, not that big a deal. Give them a steroid shot, reset the shoulder, get back to life, stop painting your kiddo's ceiling, hire somebody to do that, or just be careful. Um, let me go back there. Other injections, you can do toward all injections into that space, PRP, stem cells, you can do prolotherapy, you can just dry needle that area. There's all different studies on saying which one is better than the other. Ultimately, we know, again, that, gosh darn, that rotator cuff doesn't have good blood supply, and there's a muscle imbalance problem. So if we can strengthen the shoulder and stimulate blood supply there, it's going to help. But we all still age. Some patients continue to have problems in that darn 
uh, tendinopathy doesn't go away. They still have that pain, overhead activity, reaching away from their body, and it's really bothering them at nighttime. So instead of continuing to just pump steroid in there, we'll do a little surgery. It's not done nearly as much anymore, but right underneath that uh, chromium, we can shave a little bone. It's called a decompression. We used to do it a lot more frequently, but it can be very successful. It's not our first line of treatment, but patients that have that recurrent symptoms and they've got a hook to the acromion or a little bone spurt, you shave it off, it works awesome. So what happens as that cuff continues to fail? Because it will. We don't have great blood supply. That tendon gets repetitive motion and activity and it'll start to break down. It'll actually start to tear. This can be traumatic, like we said earlier. Most of the time, it's just degenerative. By far, that's the most common, or it's just low energy trauma, just catching your door when it's opening, but that cuff is about to go anyhow, and it starts to tear. In rotator cuff tears, that muscle all only knows one thing to pull. It can't reach back out. So once it's torn, it's not going to heal itself. It, it really isn't. There's not a lot of good studies that even those partial tears ever really heal themselves. You either learn to live with it, or that tear gradually progresses. I think of that as, especially for the rotator cuff, like a bag of potato chips. Once it starts to go, it can just keep opening. So how do we treat that? Just like we talked about before, same sort of thing. Initially, you can just start with some activity modification, and sometimes that's enough. Shoot, there's probably 20% of you in this room right now that have a rotator cuff and may not even know it. It may even be as high as 30%. We can give pain medication. Anti-inflammatories can help. Again, is that the right thing to, to give? Is it decreasing any chance of healing? Maybe so. Physical therapy, there's pretty good evidence that 50% of people can respond to therapy with a small rotator cuff tear. So if you strengthen that front and back rotator cuff, that can get that muscle balance intact and you can control the pain. And if you can control the pain, it's not hurting, you have good function, Okay, just keep watching it. You don't have to charge in and fix every rotator cuff or tear. Injections work. Again, steroid shots do work really well for that. But like I said before, you give repeat steroid injections, that rotator cuff actually gets a little bit weaker over time. So we don't like to give that to our younger patients. Those younger patients that have acute traumatic tears, we actually want to get those fixed right away. They do much better if you fix them right away. Our older, more degenerative tears, hey, you can spend a little bit more time trying to do some other things to treat it. With that therapy, we also have good, good evidence of that 50% that respond to therapy. They'll typically respond within those first two months. So if they do two months of therapy and they're not showing signs of improvement, those studies show that it doesn't matter if you do another six months, two years of therapy, it's not going to get better. So they have to make a decision at that two-month mark, hey, I'm either going to live with this or I'm going to get it fixed. So what does it mean when we say a rotator cuff repair? <clears throat> well, we know that that rotator cuff, again, is always just pulling. So we have to repair it. So here comes our repair. There's lots of different constructs to make a rotator cuff repair, but they're all the same. There's nothing too fancy about it. It's really pretty straightforward. We put little eyelet screws into the bone or some sort of anchor into the bone with some suture through it. Once that through that rotator cuff, will stimulate that bone really want to stimulate that bone to get some bleeding in that area. <clears throat> and that bleeding is going to act like human epoxy is what I think of it as. And then we tie that down. Now those little anchors, they're small. That suture is passing through tendon that I just told you is poor. So we have to rely on the body to try to heal that. So we don't want to fire that rotator cuff because our arm acts like a big crowbar and can pop that repair apart pretty quick. Or it'll pull those anchors out or tear the tendon through that suture or the suture through the tendon. So that's why we have people sit in a sling, typically for about six weeks, and we're waiting for the tendon to scar the bone. That repair is just a, a spot weld. It's just a little tack. It's like the wood clamps on your wood project where you're trying to get it glued together. So for six weeks, typically we keep you in a sling. We can move it during that time with therapy. Um, long term, is that going to affect anything? No. <clears throat> in Europe, they don't even do that. They don't even start therapy until after the six-week mark, typically. After six weeks, we get you out of the sling and start to move you. When you come out of the sling, you come out of that sling and say, oh, doc, what'd you, what'd you do to me? The thing is tight and stiff and hurts. Typically takes about another six weeks to get your motion back. 
After that, we start a strengthening program, and it can take six months to a year to start to feel better after a rotator cuff repair. Again, this poor blood supply in that area. It's hard to get that to heal. So during that recovery phase, I'm a big believer in getting your heart rate up, doing something to stimulate your heart rate. At the same time, focus on your shoulder with something, and you can get some improved blood supply to that shoulder area. Your blood is what carries all your little construction workers and all the supplies that are going to repair that rotator cuff. So have your patients go for a walk. If they're not doing therapy, go for a walk and do your exercise while you're walking, while your heart rate's up. It helps, I believe. All right, so we're going to diverge from the cuff for just a second. We're going to talk about arthritis because it's important for the next stage of that rotator cuff. What is arthritis? It's when the joint surface fails. It's when that articular cartilage fails. There's all different types of arthritis from an orthopedic standpoint. Once that cartilage is shot, we have to replace that bearing surface. So there's our shot joint surface. And how do we treat that? Again, same sort of things. Activity modification, pain medications. Therapy can be helpful. As you start to get arthritis, the actual shape of the ball starts to change. You get bone spurs and that ball actually gets bigger. As that ball gets bigger, it loses its round shape. And if you go to therapy and your therapist is trying to pound you to try to get your motion back, it's probably going to hurt more. If you go, you have to go slow with that because you're, you have a square peg and a round pole at that point with bad arthritis. Injections work great for shoulder arthritis. It's not a subacromial injection. It has to be a glenhumeral injection. So if you have a patient that has some shoulder arthritis and you put steroid or medicine in the subacromial space, they're probably not going to see a whole lot of relief. So think about going intra-articular or sending them to us uh, orthodox or some of our docs that do ultrasound injections, and, man, they'll get good relief with it. We don't walk on our shoulder every day. We're not walking on it like our hip and a knee. So if you inject into the glenohumeral joint for arthritis, you can get a long-term, really long-term relief. It's not that the steroids act in that long. You just kind of calm the shoulder down. And shoot, some people can get a year of relief. Again, it's not that the steroids work in that time, but you've just kind of reset the shoulder. The ultimate treatment, though, is to rebuild that bearing surface, and we call that a total shoulder arthroplasty, and you have to replace both sides of that joint. So you need a new ball, so we just cut off the arthritis, put in a new ball surface. There's tons of different kinds, but they're all doing the same thing. You get a new socket and a fancy piece of plastic in there, and if the rotator cuff's intact and the shoulder starts to move again, patients are happy. The recovery from this, when we put that shoulder replacement in there, it's actually pretty solid right away. But to do this, you have to take that front rotator cuff off and then reattach it at the end of the case. And so for rehab, that's what we're trying to protect is that subscapularis that we pulled off and then we reattached. Once that's healed, we let people go and they can do very well for a long time. <clears throat> now what happens with these bigger, more chronic tears? We see these in our older folks, for sure, that have kind of lived with a tear for a long time. Some of our physiologically older, sicker patients will start to get these more massive tears. <clears throat> and there's some things we look for on MRI to look at that. And we can tell if that cuff is repairable or not. You see how big it is, how far it's retracted, how much it's atrophied over time. But when the shoulder functions, think about our shoulder function again. When that big, powerful deltoid fires again, it starts to pull that shoulder up, but that cuff can't keep up, so we end up with x-rays that look like that. And we would call that a massive rotator cuff tear right there. We know that you don't need an MRI for that if that humeral head is sitting up against the acromion and the acromion is starting to arc, or we call that acetabulization of the acromion. We know that, man, there's a huge tear in there, and it's probably been there for a while. That's not going to be a repair that we can make, that we can just go in and stitch that rotator cuff and give ourselves a high five. Well, we can try it and give ourselves a high five, but it's probably not going to work. Ultimately, if that stays there long enough, you start to get arthritis because the ball's not sitting in the socket and it's not wearing properly. And then you start to get bad arthritis as well. And so we call that cuff tear arthropathy or a rotator cuff tear arthropathy. How do we treat that? Again, same sort of things. Modify activity, pain medication physical therapy, there's usually still some muscles left. Some of that subscap, that inferior mar margin might be intact. <clears throat> some of the teres may still be intact. And if you strengthen that shoulder, sometimes you can get the shoulder to function pretty well. There are some patients that have this x-ray, and they're still doing great. 
And they're just living with it. This is usually our smaller females that are in their 80s. You see that, that's probably the most common that I see. But some people are extremely painful. Sometimes this is a gradual progression where that little bit of cuff that was still functioning finally fails, and then they become pseudo paralytic, where they can't even get the arm, arm to engage because they fire that deltoid, that head slips up, and they just get stuck. So then we'll take the patient and examine them to make sure the joint is moving, and we know that, oh, shoot, it's because the whole cantilever system failed. Well, how do we treat that from a surgical standpoint? <clears throat> the best is what's called a reverse shoulder replacement. And really, we just flip the shoulder upside down. So here we make a more aggressive cut. That's probably a little too aggressive. Um, the socket side, we turn the socket and put the ball up where the socket's supposed to be. We then take where the ball was and put a socket on that. Now we don't care about the rotator cuff, and when that deltoid fires, it just pistons around that ball, and shoot, patients love it. It's pretty quick recovery. It works great. It is a big surgery, so a lot of these patients are older and sicker, so they're not great candidates to undergo a big open procedure where there's going to be some blood loss. It's going to stress their heart. So we have some other ideas. But we know that once they're at this situation, we have to cheat the system. We can't give them that cool mechanical advantage of having that rotator cuff anymore. So some new things that are kind of on the horizon that have been kind of been kicking around for some time. One is we can put a little balloon in that area. Quick little surgery, doesn't take very long at all. Same day, <clears throat> same day surgery, put a little balloon, fill that with saline. It pushes that head down. And then when that deltoid fires, it can piston against that. This has been done far more in Europe, but it's now here in the US and you're gonna to start to see it more. Insurances are starting to, starting to think about approving that and it's gonna be an option for some of our sicker patients that just can't undergo a big surgery. Is it gonna be a long-term permanent fix? Probably not, but shoot, if you can buy somebody five years or something, great. It's awesome. We have some other options where we can tie um, soft tissue or grafts underneath that acromion, again, to try to lower that humeral head down and give something to a fulcrum against. And that shoulder can work okay when we do that. What about our younger patients? So we do have younger patients that have these massive cuff tears also. These younger patients can... You know, sometimes they don't have insurance. Sometimes they've had more trauma. They've had a repair, but then they fall and tear it again. They come in and that cuff is atrophied already. It's retracted really far. We look at the MRI and say, gosh, I don't think we're ever gonna be able to repair this. Sometimes we'll even go in with a camera just to grab that rotator cuff to see if it's mobile. And a lot of times it's not. We go to grab it and we have to get it to move three centimeters or something and it doesn't move at all. We know, shoot, we can't repair that. It's not gonna last if we pull it over that supraspinatus is already dried up, how do we treat that in a young person? Well, we do a superior capsular reconstruction as an option. Superior capsular re reconstruction was much more common. You know, four or five years ago, it's kind of lost some of its flair, but it's still an option. It's a pretty narrow um, indication for patients, but these younger patients, we can put a piece of tissue or graft above that shoulder where the rotator cuff is. It's not dynamic, it's just a fixed structure that we attach to the glenoid and then attach to the tuberosity. And when that deltoid pulls, it's in theory supposed to give you a fulcrum. And really it's probably just presenting that, preventing that impingement underneath the acromion and maybe stabilizing that head a little bit. But we move our arm all the time. These are younger patients, they're gonna demand a lot out of that shoulder. So that tendon, that structure that we put in there, it can fail over time. So it's not a perfect solution. All of these that we're dealing with once that cuff has failed massively is to just try to buy us time, to try to cheat the system. And it's never gonna be as good as that cool mechanical advantage that we talked about in the beginning. So review, so rotator cuff disease is a spectrum. It starts typically in our 30s and 40s where we start to get some muscle imbalance and that blood supply starts to go bad. The mainstay is balance the rotator cuff with strengthening and stimulate blood supply. Sometimes you have to do injections to shut that system down. Cuff tears, young and traumatic, you want to fix them right away. Don't try to sit on those, try to get those in to get them fixed, they'll do much better. Older degenerative, perfectly fine, 50% of people are going to respond to therapy. If it's been two months, send them to get that shoulder fixed. Bigger tears, or sorry, arthritic shoulders, we got to replace the surface. 
the recovery is going to be protecting that rotator cuff after we do that. Massive tears, cuff tear arthropathy, the best that we have right now is a reverse shoulder replacement. It's still not perfect. It's not as good as what we were built with initially, but it can be very reasonable. So that, in a nutshell, in broad strokes, is the rotator cuff. Any questions? We kind of blew through that. A lot of information in a short period of time. Cool.